What's happening, Wolf Hack? Back at you again with another episode of Market Watch Mondays. Got a lot to cover, but before we do, you know what time it is, man. Hit that fucking intro, baby. All right, so uh, I'm actually recording today at halftime of the first set of the main slate of games uh, because we got to record the BBB uh, main weekly film later with Nick and Noah. So I want to make sure I get this get this uh, video in for you guys before Monday so that uh, we don't miss the deadline, the submission deadline. Man, we're always on time, baby. Never fail you here at Big Dog. So trying to be tight with the time. And I think it's fine because the topic I want to cover today uh, is does not going to really get impacted much by the games that happen. So, um, and and the topic I want to cover is outliers right you know i had a video on this before but i kind of want to dig into it a little bit more because the central theme and the central focus and the guy that everybody is talking about right now is james fucking robinson right i hope you listen to prior videos because i've been telling you guys to scoop this guy up and you know people are we're rushing to sell high for like second round picks and you know a couple third round picks whatever because he's an undrafted free agent but man he had himself another fucking game dude 11 totes 46 carries not that great but two touchdowns, six targets, six receptions, 83 yards. So getting it done pretty much everywhere against the Dolphins on prime time Thursday night football. So if you didn't get them before last time, you're probably not going to be able to get them now, at least for any amount of reasonable price based on what I've seen going around. But, you know, it's a great topic for discussion because, like, guys like him don't hit very often, right? He's an undrafted free agent. Undrafted free agents in general just don't really hit very often. They're undrafted for a reason. But more importantly, because they're undrafted, they're viewed as more expendable. They're the first one to get cut. Like the team has no sunk cost fallacy where they feel like they need to play the guy. So they have an uphill battle to climb to even just get on a team and then to get on the field and then to like produce. So for him to do what he's done as a rookie undrafted free agent in his first year on a team that is just God awful has been, <coughs> has been extremely incredible to watch. And it's, it's like, we cannot sell short how big of a feat this is for James Robinson. So like before I say anything else, just kudos to this fucking dude for just balling out and just like taking that opportunity and fucking grabbing it, seizing it and making the most out of it. You know what's there waiting beyond that beach. Immortality. Shake it. It's yours. And you just, you love to see that. I love rooting for undrafted free agents. Everyone loves rooting for underdog. He is the ultimate underdog. And, you know, maybe that has some of my biases towards him. I don't know. Uh, if it does, so what? I don't give a shit. It's fun. You know, this is what we're here for. But I think I'm really just trying to dig down and, like, refine my process and outliers. Uh, and I think, like, you know, everyone pulls up the stats. They're quick to pull up the stats about, like, hit rates on undrafted free agents and, you know, hit rates on, uh, on running backs like him. Um, but I think that the major flaw in that thought process and something that I'm adjusting in my thought process is, like, I feel like outliers, like when you apply blanket percentages of hit rates, that should happen before the NFL. So before, as a prospect, no one's going to make the argument that more draft capital is worse, right? That's dumb. That, that, that's like the, the, the people that I've seen on Twitter trying to argue like more volume is worse. That's like just never the case, right? That is, if you see someone say something like that, just automatically fade their advice because I can, I promise you that they're not giving you anything of value. Um, but you know, someone, uh, Skyler put out a, uh, Skyler Uyen. His, his, his name is Dynasty Skyler. Uh, great guy on Twitter. You should definitely follow him. And, and you know, he tweeted out some stats on, on undrafted free agents. And, you know, it kind of caught my interest and I had a little discussion with him. But I'll throw it up on the screen. Basically says, since 2003, 12 undrafted free agents have finished with the top 24 season. Six of them have multiple top 24 seasons. Six undrafted free agents have finished with the top 12 season. And one have multiple top 12 seasons. No undrafted free agent running back has more than four top 24 seasons, and they've averaged two top 24 seasons. In comparison, there have been 64 running backs who were drafted between rounds one and three of the NFL, drafted to finish with the top 24 season. 48 of those 64 produced multiple seasons, 75%. So the gist of it is you want day one and day two RBs. No arguments from me, right? You want guys with draft capital, right? But the thing is, I think you really need to shift your mindset to account for conditional probability. That's what I'll call it. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's like as new information comes in, like, for example, before he comes to the NFL, his chances of hitting is just the hits 
in the, of undrafted free agents in the NFL divided by the number of undrafted free agents over a certain period of time, right? That's the, that's the base percentage. And, but once you get into the NFL, once you become a starter, that denominator shrinks, right? Cause not all undrafted free agents actually make it onto a team. Uh, and then beyond that, it shrinks again, because what happened, what happened to him? He got vaulted into a workhorse role again, rarely happens. So the denominator shrinks again. And then, he fucking balls out of his mind for the first three weeks, right? So again, that that sample size on the bottom, the denominator keeps shrinking. So those by by way of denominator shrinking, his odds of hitting are automatically going up because there's less and less guys like him. The more hurdles he clears, the more things he does that other undrafted free agents don't do, the better his chances are of succeeding and hitting in the future. That's that's like the main concept I want you guys to take away from this is like. Look, I, I don't bet on outliers like coming in because I'm an analytics-based person. And any analytics-based person, person will tell you the major flaw of analytics is that it misses on outliers because it, it, is, it is built to increase your odds overall by fading guys that are low-probability hits. And coming into the NFL, someone like James Robinson is a low-probability hit. The, the good thing was he was free, so I took a lot of shots on him because of the uncertainty involved in that offense, right? But now that he's in the NFL, you cannot just apply a blanket pre-NFL prospect percentage to someone that's having the type of success and the type of volume that he's getting. That's the main takeaway for me, right? And, and it doesn't just apply to James Robinson. That's something I want you guys to take away as a process, as a process change where when, when you're quoting hit rates for undrafted free agents or guys with a certain, anyone with a certain trait before the NFL, but then after the NFL, they've proven or they've shown something that you did not know or that we did not know. You need to take in that new information and adjust accordingly, right? And I think that's a big takeaway here. We can't apply undrafted free agent hit rates to James Robinson because most undrafted free agents aren't, didn't even last long enough on teams to play for one, two, didn't get a starting job. Three, didn't get, definitely didn't get a workhorse job. And four, did not produce the way that he did. He is in pretty historic company in terms of what he's been able to do, do, do what he's been able to do through his first three games, right? He's got, uh, let's see here. He's got 210 yards, right? 210 yards rushing. He's got 129 yards receiving. He's got 300 yards from scrimmage already, right? And he's got three tutties to go on top. So that puts him in pretty rare company in terms of not just undrafted free agents, just total overall. Like there's like a short list of less than 10 people that have done that in their rookie seasons in the NFL. So as he's clearing these fucking gates, we can no longer ignore what he has been doing. So you need to adjust your view of him uh, accordingly. And like the day before, uh, the day after the uh, Miami game, um, the night before, I basically tweeted out saying like, look, I can't wait to see my timeline flooded by draft capital drones talking about why you need to sell James Robinson and lo and behold, what happens the day after people flock to the Twitter verse and start tweeting out, like you need to sell high, you need to sell high. And once I started getting discussion, people pull up excuses like, Oh, you know, he was not a, he was not listed as a starter on the depth chart before, uh, before Dev, before Devin Azigbo and Rod Carl Armstead got sent to the IR and someone tweeted that. I'll throw that up for you. And that's just like, it's such a stupid tweet because you know who else was not high on the depth chart? Every single fucking rookie because that's what a depth chart preseason is. It gives the nod to the freaking vets and it's done by coffee boys. So I always say, we always say, fade the fucking noise on shitty preseason coffee boy depth charts. They don't tell you anything. So to actually scout a talent and say he's not special or say he's not good because of a preseason depth chart is so tone deaf. So I mean, that, that was like one of the worst times I saw. But also just like as I started talking to people, they keep, keep making like excuses for why he won't succeed. Like, oh, you know, Jacksonville is definitely going to draft someone next year. Really? Well, we thought they're going to get Trevor Lawrence this year. Is that going to happen? I don't fucking know. Like people always overestimate what they think they know. People will say, oh, he's an undrafted free agent. He has no contracts. So he's going to get cut. Can that happen? Absolutely, fucking it can happen, right? But the flip side of that is Jacksonville is not a competitive team, right? We know that. They have a plethora of holes to fucking fill on everywhere on their team. Offensive line, defense, cornerback, safety. Like, everywhere on their team needs to be filled, right? Are they going to spend a day two pick on a running back or fill one of those holes? I don't know. You tell me. They just fucking dumped Leonard Fournette. It was a first-round draft pick. So, I, I think, like, I think people are just too certain of, of things. And I think at the end of the day, it always goes back to my underlying fundamental philosophy 
of, fin- of fantasy football. And what that is, is you need to understand there is a range of potential outcomes, right? There is an outcome where he gets cut next year because he's an undrafted agent and they don't want to sign him to anything. There's an instance where he gets hurt and maybe he gets cut because they don't want to sign him to anything. But then on this side of the spectrum, there's also a scenario where he just continues to fucking ball out, proves that he is a starting running back in the NFL. The Jacksonville Jaguars realize that they have him for basically fucking free because he's an undrafted free agent and he's a running back. So he's basically getting paid a bag of fucking chips, right? And then if Gardner Minshew proves to be an even semi-capable starter, you have quarterback running back on basically no money at all, which opens up the world for you in terms of your salary uh, implications for the rest of your team and how you want to construct your roster, right? And if that happens, you have a workhorse starting running back who gets all the goal line work, gets receiving work, and gets a bulk of the carries, right? Those guys don't exist that often in the NFL. So as much as like people want to say like, oh, his hit rate is low and a hit rate on a first round pick, a hit rate on a Jerry Judy is higher than he is. I agree. I 100% agree with you. The hit rate on Jerry Judy in a 2021 first is probably better than what James Robinson will give you as, in terms of a pure raw percentage hit rate. But what that hit rate does not account for is the impact after the hit. If Jerry Judy hits and a hit is defined as a top 24 wide receiver for, for, for the purposes of this, this case study, that does not move the needle for you in terms of wins. Wide receiver twos are a dime a fucking dozen, and they don't add to your win probability at all. But if James Robinson hits, he is a workhorse running back and a potential league winner for years to come. So you need to account for not only the percentage of the hit, but the outcome of the hit and how big of an impact that has on your winning. Because James Robinson, if he hits, will 100% overshadow what Jerry Judy is. Because if he hits, if he really fucking hits, do you know what you have in your hands? A Priest Mahomes. Or sorry, not Priest Mahomes. A Priest Holmes. Arian Foster, right? These are guys that won people leagues in like back-to-back years. Some of the most valuable fantasy assets. So to like, to, it, it, it's a super long tail of, of probabilities, but the hit on that long tail is just absolutely massive and it can totally change your league. And that's why you can't sell cheap on a James Robinson for a second round pick. And if you're a contender, if you're a first round pick, this is the, the probably the question that most people are going to face is like, hey, are you going to take James Robinson or a first round pick? James Robinson or Jerry Judy? James Robinson or like Levis Chanel, like one of these great receivers. And when they ask me that, I say it depends. I say it dep- depends because I think it's a fair value. I think it's not ludicrous to pay a first round pick for James Robinson because even though he has a lower likelihood of hitting, like I said, the ceiling of that hit is massive. So, you know, people are going to ask like, what are you doing with James Robinson? I have him on, I think like nine or 10 leagues. And here's what I'm doing. I'm going to split the difference because similar to what I did with Antonio Gibson, I think you can take a value victory lap on James Robinson, right? We've told you to acquire him. We told you to pay like multiple thirds, told you to pay a second to get him. And now you can ultimately cash out for a first if you want to, but I would keep some, st- some shares in. It's kind of like, it's kind of like stock, man. Like when I, when I hit on a stock, like sometimes I'll liquidate some exposure, but keep some in to ride the potential wave down the line. And that's kind of what you have with James Robinson, because you don't want to go 100% one way or the other. Cause like I said, we don't know what's going to happen, right? There is a range of outcomes, which we are not aware of right now. There's a plethora of things that can happen. And you don't want to miss out on that tail end of return where he, in case he is an Arian Foster, where he totally fucking wins you and dominates your league for you, uh, where he gives you that workhorse running back, which you got off the waiver wire. But you also don't want to go all in on that in case he does lose his job. Then you just missed out on all the value gains you accrued from, you know, either picking him off the waiver wire or paying a third or paying a second for him to getting a potential first in another loaded 2021 class, right? And this is why I love having a bunch of leagues is because I can do that diversification strategy. I can um, sell some of him and keep some of him. And I, that's what I encourage you guys to do. And, but I'll, I will say this. I would not sell him for anything less than a first. Before trial. Uh, or a first equivalent in value. And someone posted today on Twitter and they tagged me. They said, hey, would you rather have Jerry Judy or James Robinson? And I read the comments. And obviously, quick to the comments, people were like, smash on Jerry Judy. Great deal on Jerry Judy. Great deal. Like, definitely I'm cashing out on James Robinson, Jerry Judy. And look, Jerry Judy's cool, right? Jerry Judy's great. But he needs to have a Calvin Ridley type ascension to actually have an impact on your team. If he's just like a perennial wide receiver too, nobody fucking cares. He's not going to win you any leagues. You'll, pl- you'll plug him in your lineup and you'll need him. But those guys, you can pluck them off everywhere week to week. They do not change. They do not make a difference in your wins and losses call. Similar to how like running backs don't make 
You know how people say like running backs don't matter? It's not they don't matter. It's they matter less because they do not contribute enough to a wins and losses column in the real NFL. Well, that's what wide receivers are in fantasy football. So you need to really consider it. And I said, look, it really depends on the team. Like most of the time, yeah, I'll take Jerry Judy because I think that's a good play. But, you know, I'm definitely going to keep James Robinson if there's like a contention or, or you know, he somehow – contributes to helping me win now and I really need a running back because one wins beats winning championships beats winning trades 100 100 times out of 100 but more importantly it goes back to the concept that I mentioned before is that even though James Robinson is a lower likelihood of hitting if he hits he will 100% have a higher impact on your team's win win column than Jerry Judy will if Jerry Judy hits right not all hits are equal like, you need to really grasp that around your head. When everyone says, like, oh, so-and-so hit, so-and-so hit, half of those hits don't fucking matter, man. Like, like hitting as a wide receiver two, wide receiver three, hitting as an RB, like, low-end RB two, really, really doesn't matter. You need to look at the quantifying impact of potential league winners. And when you have someone that can be a league winner on your hands in Dynasty, a potential workhorse running back, you need to fucking pay me to get rid of him. And... Like, yeah, sure, I might lose I may lose out on the value of a first round pick down the line, but that is like way less bad than losing out on an Aaron Foster or a Priest Holmes. I'm not saying he's a Priest Holmes or an Aaron Foster. I'm just saying like there is a scenario where he plays himself into a role like that. And even in a scenario where he plays himself into the Leonard Fournette role, like that's hella valuable and way more valuable than than what Jerry Judy can be as a twenty two year old prototype running back. Now I want to provide another example of this just so we don't make this entire episode about James Robinson, even though I love him and and I could easily do that just based on what's happened. But like another example, of this is Terry McLaurin, right? Terry McLaurin is the ultimate outlier from a wide receiver perspective. And, And what I mean by that is from an analytics perspective, he has a horrible profile. He did not break out in college. He did not differentiate himself. Uh, despite playing on a team with you know somewhat mediocre talent at wide receiver uh, he was he's an incredibly old prospect which is another ding for wide receiver he was a senior he was not an early declare which is another ding on wide receiver prospect so coming into the draft the only thing that he had going for him was was draft capital he got drafted in the round three which is which is pretty good and his athletics because he's a fucking athletic freak right but as an analytics person, like I don't care about those things as much as I care about a collegiate production profile because it's proven that a good profile leads to more hits in the NFL. All true, right? But I had to adjust and pivot because what we saw was like he came into the NFL and he absolutely balled year one. He was one of the best performing rookie wide receivers by almost every advanced metric. Uh, the film guys love them as well, who I really value. Um, so what you see is, me kind of making a little bit of shift and saying like that same pivot where it's like, Hey, before he came in as a prospect, I applied a certain percentage to his hit rate and it was low. It was not good. Right. But now after one year of production, I can no longer apply that same percentage because we have new information. It goes back again to the thing I talked about before is conditional probability and conditionally the probability has changed because not many rookie wide receivers came into a league like he did and dominated like he did. So after I made that pivot, I acquired a bunch of uh, Terry McLaurin throughout the offseason. I drafted a bunch of Terry McLaurin. I have him in the What It Do Dynasty League with Nick and, and uh, Noah and some of the other guys. Uh, I have him in a couple of other Dynasty Leagues as well. And the reason why I, I'm okay with fading outliers before they come into the NFL and betting on them later is because you can you could still acquire Terry McLaurin for a very reasonable price, right? And, I yeah, sure, I paid more than someone did uh, in the draft in his rookie year. But I also faded all the other guys that look like Terry McLaurin that busted. And that all just comes back to implementing this process where you have to take into account new information and account for conditional probability, right? Account for new information. Do not have take lock. Do not have take lock. Because, like, I've seen it with Terry McLaurin from my analytics friends. I've seen it with guys like James Robinson. Like, once you have a preconceived notion in your head, it's really tough, like, psychologically for us to overcome our, like, biases, right? That's just a hard thing to do as a human being. There's, there's like really no way around it, but you got to fucking battle against that. And I battle with it like all the time. But like, if you listen to like the James Robinson doubters, like they make all these excuses. Right. And, and I threw up a tweet that was, that was like kind of mocking it, but it's like, you know, you make all these excuses about like how he's going to get his job replaced by fucking career backups, how he's going to, you know, get replaced next year in the draft. But at the end of the day, like it just comes down to four letters. You could have all saved your fucking selves a lot of times by just, by just saying UDFA. 
that's at the end of the day, doesn't matter what else happens. Like you could watch the film and you know, you could think that he's good. If Cam Akers was doing what that, everyone would be fucking blowing their load on Cam Akers. If JK Dobbins was doing what he was doing, you'd be paying three first right now for JK Dobbins, right? I mean, the only difference between those guys and what James Robinson did is like one, James Robinson is producing and two, he's an undrafted free agent. Terry McLaurin, the only difference is, you know, he does not have a collegiate, good, a good collegiate profile. So, you know, coming in, you look for guys with good collegiate profiles and you cut them more slack because you think they're going to come back down the line. Right. But again, just stay fluid, stay fluid in your process and account for fucking conditional probabilities. That is the whole point of this outlier episode is you need to account for conditional probabilities because it absolutely matters. Take in the new information, adjust your rankings accordingly. It is a valid adjustment and I do it all the time. And for guys like James Robinson, for guys like Terry McLaurin, I've already adjusted. People talk about overreacting. I don't think it's overreacting. I think it's just reacting. I think if anything, people are too slow to react to new information. They're too stuck in their old ways and they're too fucking hung up on take lock to actually adjust. So hope that was helpful. I'm going to get back to watching the games and we're going to come back to you with the, with the weekly film as well. So make sure you hit that up. If you liked what you saw, hit the subscribe button, hit the like. It'll help us more than you know. And uh, look, I'll see you guys next week for another episode of Market Watch Mondays. Wolfpack, that's it for this week. We're out. Enjoy the games.